No, Flaky for now. Now I do. Yeah. yeah. Should have oh, gone by air. Sorry, then. flaky internet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I think what what to quickly recap. Yeah, so you said you you got something else from Fatiando. I don't know harmonica or Verde as an X-ray to net CDF. Yeah. Um, into Gempi is hopefully possible soon, but it has to be as a data frame, right? Is that about the gist of it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to import it into Gempi at the moment, you need to convert the net CDF to a data frame, and then you need to set the columns to specific names. Um, there's some scope there for maybe in Gempi allowing one to specify what you want as which is your X column and which is your Y column and that sort of thing. At the moment, automatically from the data frame. Um, so far, that's the only method. Uh, at the moment, the to plot a huge number of points to create the surface. Um, and they're not plotting where they should be, but I'll, I'll stay for Miguel to take a look at uh, tomorrow. And hopefully, hopefully, it's me just doing something stupid because I'm not new, because I'm very new to the library. So, yeah. And but it's actually that's relatively straightforward. Yeah, I, th I think that where you uh, left the project for me is very easy. Yes, to take it and, and interpolate. So, I th tomorrow morning we will have something. And, and Miguel, is that something like you think Chempa is going to support NetCDF, or you would like that subsurface would take care of that? Uh, I will choose you subsurface to take off of that. I mean, th this is a bit what we were talking uh, between regular structures and irregular structures. So yeah. normally in Genpy, the input is irregular because it's just points in a space. The output is regular. So the output at the moment are just NumPy arrays of the same shape, which that makes a lot of sense to put it in X-Array. Yeah. So, but, but technically did, from, yep. Uh, I did have a quick comment because there was like, I posted this, I think either in the Slack or onto that HackMD. There are some, um, um, like the array interface um, for NumPy, there are some sort of like class attribute level things that we can take advantage of that would allow, like, it's like Dask has a data frame object that like is um, interchangeable effectively with a pandas data frame, for example. So I think it's just like a little bit of like looking through the APIs and trying to find that like clever little thing that will um, end up being a change in GemPy. So you'd be changing the type assertions to like anything that implements the data frame class, right? It's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a data frame. Uh, but I agree also that like the outside, like the output of the grids, X-ray sounds good. Um, yep. Yes, I, I, I don't know. So, so the thing is that a data frame definitely is a different object that the 2D X-ray and you have to translate it, but it's really easy to translate it. So, having it as a template, an X-Array, and then if some libraries use data frames or if they use directly to the X-Arrays, I mean, that's something that I, I guess this is small detail, but that those are things to, to think of, uh, definitely. Cool. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say that changing, uh, changing a data set from X-Array into a data frame is Fair reveal uh, may need to because you end up with a end up with multi um, data frame, but lines to get from three lines to go from in to having a workable. Um, yeah, so so maybe it's more important to agree in in the name of the coordinates or of the columns uh, that that if it's an X array or a data frame because if the names are the same, then it's a straightforward. But yeah, that's something to be seen. Cool. It'd be an interesting thing to think about with the subsurface libraries, basically having like a dictionary where we can coerce things to a common, um, like a common key, um, because things like, you know, easting or um, X or Y, uh, those sorts of things is being able to coerce some of those. I mean, some things are perhaps ambiguous, like depending on which coordinate your system you're using X and Y, 
um, is, is potentially ambiguous, um, but other sort of common um, common terms might, yeah, might might be useful for us to basically come up with like this is sort of a standard set of uh, terms that we use and try and try and translate between the codes that way. Do you know if there is something like that in the open mining format? Um, so actually, that is worth looking at. Um, there is so it's built on a library called properties which does allow that sort of coercion um let me just take a look at the at this back here Yeah, I'll, I'll have a look and see. Um, I don't know. I don't know offhand. No, but 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 it's a, a really good idea, and actually that's something that I was also thinking eh, that if we want to have a bridge library that we can just put different topographies, we have to to have a clear translation between different coordinate systems, for example. Yeah. So that that is metadata that X-Array also allows you to to add append pretty easy, but. So, so, so the only thing that I'm a bit afraid that this step is that I don't know how many of those things we have to think prior to start writing code and how much we can just go as <laughs> as, as we are start adding things. Yeah, but I imagine like as a first step, I mean, basically just catching which coordinate system each package uses is probably enough. I mean, so Sympeg, we try and do uh, right-handed coordinate system Z positive up. Um, and so yes. that, and that's pretty consistent throughout the throughout the entire code base. Um, but I imagine other code bases might might use a different coordinate system. So yeah, even no, if so, we so, track who's doing what. Um, in in Jepa, we have the matricial system. That that's true. That I remember last year, Dita has to to change it. That's. Yeah. But it's true. That's metadata. That as long as it's clear and you know which function you need to use to translate, obviously it's going to add overhead, which is never good, but at least. But I do think like like packages like NetCDF and, and X-Array and probably Pangeo, they did a fair bit of thinking about that. So I don't think we have to redo that, but we should find out where that is documented yep. and just reuse it instead of getting yet another standard definition. I, I, I agree completely. That's why I, I like the idea of using X-Array because they, ha they are doing very similar things. Uh, but if we start just taking NumPy and start making classes and stuff, it's, it's just creating yet another standard. <laughs> um, maybe I can actually speak to that because I was at it because I was working on that uh, on the on the subsurface thing. That was, so the idea behind subsurface was to like have a common data format that is like the um, GOIO for. Like you can load your seismic into that and then access that into into like PyVista and all that. Um, of course, uh, no one ever worked on that after transform, so um, that's a bit of a problem. But um, yeah, I, 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 I want to I want to start working on that, and, mm. and I'm, I'm I have funding to work on that in the next couple of years. So, so that's why the whole idea cool. is coming up again. <laughs> okay, yeah. So with subsurface was based on x-ray and uh, the problem is that x-ray is basically pandas in nd and pandas already does not support any subclassing and x-ray supports it even less and the idea that matt had was that you want like a seismic class and then a well class and all that and um like it was clear on that week that this is absolutely not possible with um, X-Array without completely rewriting it or completely breaking it. So you have to do some kind of uh, basically registering into X-Array that you have like a sub module in, in X-Array, um, which for me would be perfectly fine um, because then you can still access all the other modules or even mix and match modules if you want to. Um, but yeah, that's something to think about that X-Array cannot be, I, I forgot the right words because it's like a year ago and my brain is a bit fried already. But um, you can't really subclass it, but you have to register into yeah. X-Array. That's something to consider. And but you can always just create an object eh? that is the X-Array that's composite. 
that's al always my yes you can my wrap, approach you can wrap it but it so you create a class that one of the attributes is the x-ray and then you add the functionality on top like, like that you you have a much better encapsulation in some part you can subclass it and then you have all the goodies of it and it's kind of very stable but you cannot do that with x-ray or i don't know why but now uh, chess possesses it it's because pandas already doesn't support it so yeah i don't know the deeper reasons yeah yeah but what i mean is that i don't know how many things can you do if you just iterate a class that you cannot do if you just compose it is, is the um, yeah. compose it well uh, yeah. so the the point that we already ran, ran into with that like simple thing that we did we tried the uh, wrapping and we wanted a seismic class we loaded some seismic if you slice into the seismic you do not get a seismic object back but you get an x-ray object back so there is no object persistence through even through sli slicing um, and because you're just wrapping it, you don't really have access to the um, to the Dunder methods. Um, yeah. So you'd either have to overload them, overwrite them, or something like that. So you really have to do some um, black magic to to get that going. That. Um, that's something to consider. But apart from that, like if you if you subscribe to the like registering into it, which uh, MetPy does, the stuff that um, John Lehman is writing. So they are basically registering into X-Array and using that and doing that very successfully. Um, so yeah, I, I would suggest going that path, but I mean, for, for the whole coordinate stuff, um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's a really good idea. And then if you have like um, uh, like uh, connection points to PyVista, to GemPy, to Simpack, you can basically define how they define the coordinate system. So if you just have like a common um, coordinate system in the in the base class, then you can always talk out and just uh, use their, like convert to their conventions, which is also possible by changing um, the, so, um, X-Array basically has coordinates and it has dimensions. Dimensions are a bit of a like special property uh, which you can slice along and stuff, but you can also change out um, dimensions for coordinates. I don't know how much splaining I'm doing here. Like most of you probably know half, at least 50% of what I'm talking about. But yeah, you can change them out so it should be able you should be able to calculate them while you ingest them. So you have all the coordinates available, like SIMPAC coordinates, PyVista coordinates, and then you can um, just set those as the dimensions and pass them out, um, stuff like that. Um, don't know if that would be too much overhead when you start well, having too many. Maybe, but then it wouldn't even have to be really fast because you would go to another package once and then the heavy calculation computation is in that package and it wouldn't have to change anymore, right? So you would yep. have to get from from Chempy once to subsurface and then to to Simpeg and then the heavy computation will happen in Simpeg and it wouldn't have to convert anymore once. Yeah, I think that at the beginning it is better to have this that yeah. the speed is not an issue. So for example, I don't see any time soon not importing PyVista directly in Chempy. If I, if I want to just have interaction that you move the point and you recompute, you cannot put a lot of overhead in between. But at least that we have something that we know that is stable and that works to communicate the libraries. Then if, if you really want to communicate very closely the libraries, then that's a different story. Cool. So, already half an hour. Brian, anything from you from today that you want to pass along to them? Uh, well, I, I don't know that I have anything to add to the current discussion. Um, but I guess I have been working on uh, taking an image of say a log like a sedimentary log and then turning it into a strip log and then attaching a deviation survey to it so like a, a GPS log tracks to it and then that would give it a 3d space and then trying to visualize that both in PyVis is the next step and then GemPy um, and then hopefully this link that we're all working on here I can combine that together um, and then it'd be great to have like some sort of little notebook or tutorial of how 
to go from a paper log to this 3D object that you can display. That's the plan. I don't know if I'll get to it, um, to where I want to be, but I've got, I've got a plan and goals. That is cool. That sounds good. So you started with a paper log. You got into the strip log, added deviation, and you could plot it in 3D from, from the paper. Start That's the plan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that's the plan. Yeah, so just like a notebook log, uh, you walk through and you write down descriptions and thicknesses and stuff. Yeah, and then take that to a strip log, add a deviation, visualize in three D, is the the plan, anyway. Um, but I think it would take it would save such a headache. I mean, it would save me hours, days, weeks during my PhD, um, to have this already. So hopefully, I can save someone else that headache. Cool. So we had Martin, we had Brian and Miguel. Anything from today? No, I was help, helping a bit. I'm preparing the tutorial that you will, will see. Yeah. Hopefully on Tuesday. So <laughs> not spoilers there. Me too. I'm, I'm trying to get <laughs> I'm trying to get the example that we created last year getting work into the gallery of, of Chempai which seems to have some problem with Pi MC 3D. But then also here on the ghosting, software underground ghosting repo, I just posted the link. So first go at an environment of YAML where it actually works, this one, and it has Pi Vista, Verde, Pooch, Harmonica, Bull, Rockhound, Simpeg, EMG 3D, uh, Segway, IO, X-Ray, and Chempai, and it's all in one environment that actually compiles. So that's kind of a first go at easily have an, an environment. I have to try to add PyMC3. That's that's what blows up everything apparently. <laughs> no, but that's just in the yeah, that's in the in the Chempai, <laughs> Travis. I I get there. I get there. But so Bane, Bane is going to do that to Dockerize it maybe. He said so. We'll see that. Doing that right now. Um, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea to do, get a Docker, just use the Miniconda base image from, from Docker Hub and um, just add all these packages in there. Have that just sort of as a vanilla geoscience Docker image that people can pull and, and start running simulation code across these packages. And then maybe add a few more layers um, for integration with like Jupyter Lab. Um, so that way we just have a, a Docker image that you can just launch and it will just pop up a web browser with connected to Jupyter Lab. Um, cool. It's a really dull work because you add a package, you install it, you remove it, then it fails. But it's sort of important when you want to have, if you want to have a separate package that they have an environment that all of this play together otherwise. Yeah, I, I think I might take a crack at adding uh, Gempy to a to the Conda Forge. Um, I'm already on Conda Forge for my own project, and I, I had a similar I had similar issues with Pi MC3, and it's just because like Fiano is like very long in the tooth at this point. Um, so I, I think like specifically, it's there's like you get run into issues of, like fancier things like Jupyter Lab and. Um, like other Jupyter like interfacing tools that push something up in version like Cython or something that breaks something else in Pi MC3. Um, so it was actually a huge pain to fix, but um, maybe by having a Conda Forge, at least we'll have visibility on that issue or a more reliable way to fix that. Um, that really helpful. Yeah. Once it's there, once it's on the feedstock issue, then they're really helpful in jumping in them. Cool, that, that's really cool, Andrew. If that would work, I think that would also help Chempai a lot if it's on Conda Forge. Yes, definitely. So, so I, I, I wrote you that I really don't understand why Pi MC3 is giving problems and Chempai not, because normally Theano is what gives problems and both libraries mm -hmm. rely on it. But yeah, it was like an install order thing. Like I had to, yeah. it's like <laughs> maybe I had to like install Theano first, then like Pi GPU separately. Like, there's something really weird and like I've solved this now like a few so, times and I just sort of go back and so in, in Windows well I, I, I update it also for, for this hackathon and quite a lot of the installation page of, of Chempai with the easy thing if it works and with very detailed explanations how but but yeah no I yeah I, I think Dom and, and Lindsay they could 
tell you a hundred stories of users that had trouble to install it, discretize. And since it's on Conda Forge, I think it completely disappeared, right? It's just not an issue anymore. It's just gone. So, yeah. yeah. I also posted this to like the that hacker MV file, but uh, it's a better interrupt with uh, discretize and gempy and PyVista. Although a lot of it's like really there because I have this really cool thing where I'm so for my models I have like um, these 22 by five or six kilometer sort of digital elevation models that I'm um, mapping in a GIS environment, and I'll have like maybe 20 to 30 stratigraphic layers um, in there, just the bedding surfaces because we're not resolving anything that like a trained sedimentologist would recognize as like a layer. I think there's different terminologies in the different fields, but um, like I used um, the refine mesh function and in, in, uh, in discretize to take like, cause I, I have meter resolution of like elevation models that's vertically um, point to point 20 centimeter vertical resolution. So, and this is over like 20 kilometers, right? So I, I like I, need to make really big grids to evaluate. But as soon as you go like hundreds by hundreds by hundreds, um, you start running into, you know, cubic growth <laughs> issues, pretty memory issues. So using like the refining uh, methodology and discretize, right? Like I'm able to like produce grids that are denser, like on the topography that I actually have. So like, cause I don't need it to be so dense um, everywhere else. But then the problem was I couldn't use the, um, the Marcia Cubes algorithm and GemPy directly to like make nice surfaces. And like, I think I did use something that was in PyVista that did something sort of okay. And I recognize like, okay, I have like a irregular, non completely regular mesh. So it's only going to do so much, but cause there's like missing triangles and stuff and I'm still just learning some of these things. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so the Marcia Cube that is, is the one in Psychic Image, the one that we are using. Yeah. And that is for a very regular grid. But I think that there is no reason why it has to be like that. That's yeah. It was like it was like it's like and going back towards sort of like the environment, like you were saying, Windows. Like I tend to I develop on my Mac, and I'll like run like quick tests on my Mac. But for like the more serious runs, I'll either use my Linux computer or my um, university has a Slurm HPC um, cluster. But I don't, for example, like I, I know Docker and I've used, I was using Docker back in like 2015, but um, I don't think they have Docker on that HPC. Like there's not like, I, as much as I would love Kubernetes and to just have things auto scale and stuff there, there's like, there's a lot of like HPC computing that's just done on Slurm and various SSH terminal, terminals, right? So, um, but I think the one second, this kind of forge thing might help with that. Sure thing. Thanks. I'm going away. I think that cam the camera is going down. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, that that wraps it up from our side. Are there any questions from you, Andrew, Lindsay, Dom, Bain, who will maybe continue a couple of hours in contrary to us? Otherwise, we will catch uh, we'll see tomorrow what you've been up to today. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, but I also realize I could talk forever. Um, I'm mainly looking for validation in the things that I'm doing um, because there's not, there, there are basically zero subsurface people in my subdiscipline of planetary science. Although it was kind of cool post earlier, someone was talking about using lunar uh, GPR um, data from the Chinese rover. But yeah, like I like I'm using GemPy because GemPy could fit multiple conformal surfaces at the same time. I would also like to use Verde like as a comparison because there's this continuum of interpolation uh, techniques that are out there and be great to make them pluggable. So I could substitute GemPy in or I could train an MLP with sklearn or Keras or whatever and to directly like I've been developing code that allows me to calculate like mean squared error and things in real world coordinates um, through cross validation. So that that's like mainly through making, I have a, a custom grid I made that's called a borehole. It's a virtual borehole that I'm basically putting into my model domain and calculating the grid at a very dense vertical resolution. And then like figuring out where the surface in GemPy 
is versus where it's expected to be. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's very cool. It's not open. I haven't like opened it, sourced it yet. Cause I just, I just have like a lot of crud for my own environment in that repository, but some of these things could be content, uh, potentially be contributed back with some work. Uh, ben, just a quick question for you. I started, uh, I unzip your, <laughs> your big drop of stuff here. So are we going to key, are we going to carry on with OMF? Um, <clears throat> are we taking it out of OMF? I, I didn't follow the conversation. What are we doing for, uh, for, for this week? I don't know. Um, I just uploaded all that data. Um, so on yeah. that Dropbox folder that I, I created, there are um, a few folders. The Utah Forge folder has sort of a lot of the raw, raw data um, that I pulled from the GDR, like CSV files, Excel spreadsheets, you know, whatever is uploaded to GDR. Um, in the folder called Bain's previous work, there's another data directory, and in there, there's a number of OMF file archives. Um, that I created from those data. Um, and I, I don't think I included any of the notebooks where I actually go through and parse all the raw data, create the OMF data structures, and then dump them out, um, which I don't know why I didn't include that last night, because that's probably important. Um, but um, I can get on that. Um, so a lot of the data is already aggregated in OMF, which makes it a lot easier for us to just sort of take those data files and load them via OMF um, and start um, throwing them at SimPeg and GymPy and all that because we can get them in NumPy data structures um, pretty much, I think, out of the box from OMF because they use the properties array object, which is or isn't a NumPy array. I'm not sure. It inherits from, it inherits from NumPy, I believe. Cool. And that's more a general question. Is OMF going anywhere? Because uh, by the sound of it, no one's going to be supporting it anymore. So are we, are we pushing it or? I'll ping Franklin and Rowan um, and get a sense from them if that is something that's going forward. I know that properties is probably not, um, but there is a cool library that um, Franklin pointed us to called Pydantic. Um, that has a lot of the same functionality. So for folks who are not familiar with properties, sorry, this is the SimPeg ecosystem relies on it pretty heavily, um, but it does basically strong typing in Python plus coercion and validation. Um, and so doing things like, you know, checking sizes of arrays and things like that and, and giving errors or um, being able to coerce strings into the, the string that we want to work with in the code base. Um, so that we've been using properties for that, um, but Franklin pointed us to Pydantic as um, a, a more of like Python 3, 6 plus um, version of, of that. It's pretty similar um, in spirit. So that's something to, to look at and it could be quite useful for this effort. Um, yeah, and so I'll follow up and get a sense from them of if if OMF is going forward, or if not, um, how we might actually sort of extract sort of the useful pieces and maybe build on that, because there might be some things that we could pull out or rewrite um, that would still be useful to kind of give it give it a new life. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Because I, I, I just saw now that it's all binary, so I guess if the library is not maintained, uh, there's no point in throwing data in it, right? I'm really surprised. I thought this OMF was a big industry initiative. How, how did that die so quickly? What, what? Yeah, I mean, Joseph merger, <laughs> or merger as usual. Quite possibly. I mean, because it was really started as an effort to try and streamline interoperability between different software packages. Um, but there's, you know, depending on which company you're working for, there may or may not be motivation to actually interoperate with other other groups. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, some of that politics might have crept in and, and yeah. slowly, slowly it had is, it is important to think carefully about if, if it should be pending. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because it was a big effort by the Global Mining Standards Group. Um, so, well, like, potentially an interesting outcome is, you know, what we develop 
um, do this work could be sort of a next iteration of some of those ideas. It may or may not, you know, depend on OMF, um, probably not, but uh, it could be sort of a new iteration that maybe maybe would revitalize at least the spirit of that effort. Yeah, but, but the thing with, yeah, instead of depending on it, they could implement it and build up on it straight in subsurface, for instance. So, yeah. so, so, so the, the gut feeling I'm having is that the closer we are from the basic, so, so NumPy eh, or X-Ray. Python uh, object. Yeah. And, and then a bit flavor here and there, but that is a Python object and, and that's it. So, so e even the idea of, of generate that and start adding functionality, I think that, that that deviates a bit because then it's not an X array anymore. So I really think that it would be better if we just keep uh, how to manipulate these objects and leaving it like they are. So, but yes, that's a, a yeah. thought look into this. Discussion. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I think um, from my perspective, the things that I see that are, are useful in, in OMF is really the way that they've defined sort of data structures. Yeah. And I think that a lot of those ideas could be completely replaced by X-Array, um, but sort of thinking through like what actually are all the geologic structures we need to implement. So we need point clouds, we need lines, we need boreholes, we need surfaces, um, volumes, and those might be existing on different meshes. So I think at least like the general sort of structure and like hierarchy of what what the data types that we're dealing with are, were really well thought out. Um, but completely agree that we don't want, um, yeah, we we want to stay as close to like NumPy and X-Array um, as as we can. Yeah. So. The other thing I want to point out about OMF, um, I've I've really enjoyed using it. It's been really easy to use in the past, um, which is why like for a lot of my projects, I just aggregate data into OMF archives because they have these um, data structures that can handle a lot of typical subsurface data. Um, but if you go and you look at the OMF code, it's not a lot of code. It's, um, it's just a few classes and they're almost like really meta. Um, it's just saying, you know, here is a, um, a, a property, they use the properties library. So you can just say, here's an array, here's a description of what that array is supposed to be, um, such as like the X, you know, the spatial reference or whatever. Um, and they just, you know, it's just a super declarative thing about labeling data arrays. Um, and so we could probably pretty easily translate it to use X array instead and just translate the same concepts. Because if, you know, you go into any one of these files, they're like 100 lines of code and it's just a class definition. Exactly. Look, let's take the same class as probably based on X array and replace properties with pydantic, pydantic or whatever, something like this to bring it up to maintained libraries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds cool. Is this something that we'd potentially want to like fork the project and sort of start from there, or is it easier to start from start from scratch? For me, I'd start from scratch just because it's not a lot of code, and then just yeah. you know, in the README, say this is heavily inspired by um, by GM, GMG, and I think it's under an MIT license, so very permissive. Um, one other thing that we ra right in the beginning ran into is um, that you want to care about oh, what's it called units um, and I think there's pint we used pint back in the day um, but I think x-ray there, there someone shared some library that worked with x-ray almost out of the box I think and um, definitely we we should care about that because um, when you get your wells in feet per second and your <laughs> seismic in uh, kilometer per second and then want to have your grid in meter per second, uh, you uh, you want that to be as easy as possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, if we can somehow get that in in there, I think um, that would be extremely valuable. Yeah, but but it's true that the X-ray supports units. To some extent, I don't know how, but but I read it. That's true. I think the library um, that does units with X array is white the YT project's Unix library, unit with a Y, I mean, not an I. Cool. So another, I guess, uh, another. Interesting quote for me is who will be around tomorrow on Sunday? I will be the morning. 
you'll, you'll join the, the nine o'clock session. Yeah, I will be co-hosting that with Filippo. Cool. You too, Martin. I expect Dom and Lindsay will be there too, nine o'clock hero time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Coincidentally, I'm uh, on maybe uh, a little uh, bit late. My cool. So I was going to say I may be a little bit late. I tend on somewhere in the mid Atlantic um, as my actual sleep cycle. <laughs> um, but I will be there in the morning between nine and cool. And and next weekend, are folks around or possibly? I think if we have a yeah concrete action plans, uh, I'm willing to work uh, to do a you know shift my my time schedule to the to you guys because um, if we uh, if if that's going to be the the time that we're actually going to do real real work if everything goes well next week, so uh, I I'll be there I'll, I'll do I'll do whatever I can. Filippo shared some cool apps. I will look into those this week like whiteboards for collaborative thinking or stuff like that, that we might do some sketching out of how we could go forward with, with, with a library or something like this. Something more interactive that people can draw and, and write and, and juggle ideas if that is something that could help to uh, gather. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, and I'll echo Dom, I mean, uh, to a reasonable time, but I'm happy to try and get up a bit earlier and, and increase the overlap in our in our time windows. Because um, I think this is this is an important project. So if we can get some momentum, that'd be great. Yeah, I think tomorrow I'll manage to like I'll never be there at nine. Uh, that's not a time I know uh, to. But um, yeah. I can probably also then come a bit later. Tomorrow is a protest here that I'm going to attend. But um, if I don't get arrested, I'll be here after three. Um, so I might be able to also manage some of the uh, overlap then as also being somewhere mid-Atlantic mid to almost US <laughs> in my actual uh, sleep cycle. But um, that might help. Sorry, I didn't manage today. Yeah. Cool. That's it from my side. Anything else? Then. Have a good uh, have a good Sunday and we'll uh, we'll we'll touch base I guess along the way next week. See you on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, so probably tomorrow similar time if people are around. Uh, uh, what time is it now? Seven. What time was for you now? Is that early? Seven uh, on the West Coast, you mean? Yes. When did we start it? This meeting. Oh, we probably yeah around ten yeah. Oh, what time? What time you say? <laughs> yeah, I think we started at ten. Yeah. Would that be doable tomorrow, or uh, I can I can chime in again probably tomorrow. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything to contribute, but I can listen. Well, you can contribute to what, what you do today. <laughs> <laughs> you want to slave me today? <laughs> I'm catching up work. <laughs> catching up work, fair enough. <laughs> cool guys. Have a good day, evening. Good. Night. Tomorrow. Thanks for organizing us all, Dieter. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's been good.